table as you come into the sanctuary. Feel free to pick those things up. As we continue in our worship service this morning, I'd ask you to reflect on the words of this song as our praise team leads us in hungry. <laughs> comes once again from the Gospel according to John. This morning we are looking at John chapter 6, verses 1 through 15. Hear now the word of the Lord. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him, because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. 
Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the men sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Let us pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you open it to us the power of your Holy Spirit. We might understand what you say to us today. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here among us, upon me and upon all those who listen to the things that are spoken this morning, the things that are heard and remembered and taken to heart might not be from me, Lord, but from you. We pray all of these things that the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. A young man called his mother and told her excitedly that he had just met the woman of his dreams. He said, now what do I do? Well, his mother had an idea. She said, well, why don't you send her flowers and on the card invite her to your apartment for a home-cooked meal? He thought this was a great strategy, and a week later, the young woman came to dinner. His mother called the next day to see how things had gone. I was totally humiliated, he moaned. She insisted on washing the dishes. Well, what's wrong with that? asked his mother. We hadn't started eating yet, <laughs> was the reply. <laughs> Some meals can go better than others. This morning, we're continuing our series in John's Gospel by looking at one of Jesus' most well-known miracles, the feeding of the 5,000. If you've been around the church for a while, you've probably heard of this one before. It's a Sunday school staple. All four of the Gospel writers talk about this one. And it certainly made an impression on those who were present for it. The meal was a success, mostly. The guests were full, but they completely missed the entire point. As we picked up, as we pick up the gospel story here in John six, Jesus has been busy. As we read through the other gospels, Matthew and Mark and Luke, uh, we see that, that this miracle occurred after a lengthy season of ministry in Galilee. John passes over a lot of those details. But Jesus has been very active. And on top of this, as we see the story in Matthew's Gospel, we read that this occurs right after Jesus has heard of the death of his cousin and forerunner, John the Baptist, at the hands of King Herod. And so, in the midst of all of these things, perhaps fatigue after a long series of season of ministry, processing the news about John the Baptist, Jesus withdraws with his disciples from the region in which he had been active. He goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which was not as Jewish of an area as the part where Jesus was from. And in the northeastern section of the Sea of Galilee, uh, bordered into some areas that were controlled by the Gentiles. So Jesus withdraws the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But even as he is trying to get away, 
News about him keeps percolating out there. By this time, Jesus has become well known in Galilee. And people have noticed some of his other miracles, especially the healings that he's done. And so even when Jesus tries to get away, people from all over Galilee continue to seek him out. And when he sees them coming, he takes the opportunity for an object lesson. He gives his disciples a difficult task. He says, where can we buy bread for all these people to eat? Now they're out in the wilderness with nary a bakery to be found, let alone the facilities to feed the equivalent of a small city. But the disciples don't even get as far as the where question. They get stuck on the how question. Jesus wants to feed all these people. And Philip observes that 200 denarii would not be enough money to feed this crowd. Now, a day's wage for a laborer at that time was a single denarius. So, as the NIV puts it, this represents eight months' worth of wages for the average worker. Considerably more resources than Jesus and his disciples had access to, at least in physical sense. In fact, when they take stock of their resources, all they can come up with is some kid's lunch. <laughs> Andrew finds a boy who is willing to share a meager five loaves of bread and two fish. And that really wouldn't be enough for Jesus and his disciples, let alone a crowd of 5,000. But Jesus is not fazed by this. Jesus takes what the disciples bring. He gives thanks for it. He distributes it. And when everyone has eaten, there are 12 basketfuls of leftovers. The disciples were doubtful. The disciples were dismayed. But Jesus provides in abundance. Jesus' kingdom is one of abundance. There is always enough. Jesus still asks his disciples to do difficult things. He tells us to represent his kingdom in a world that is hostile to him and to those who follow him. He tells us to be lights in the midst of darkness. He calls us to live holy lives, forgive others, Love our enemies, care for those who have less, evangelize the lost, make disciples of all nations. And it is easy to feel overwhelmed by all of this because what Jesus asks us to do is often beyond our resources. But here's what we often forget. Jesus doesn't ask us to do these things to prove ourselves to him. You see, Jesus doesn't need our help at all. He used what the disciples had to feed 5,000 people. But when we look back to the Old Testament, we recall that the Lord fed far more people than that without any help whatsoever. In Exodus 16, we read that the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord. 
because he has heard your grumbling against him. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, dew lay around the camp. When the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. For forty years the Lord fed the people of Israel with manna in the wilderness. Huge crowd. And every morning they would go out and there's the man. In the evening, look up, here comes the plan. The Lord has abundance. Jesus doesn't need a starter kit of loaves and fish. Jesus could provide food out of thin air if he had wanted to. He involves the disciples for their benefit so that they can be part of what he's doing. And to show his glory to them. Not because he needs their help. And the same is true today. Jesus doesn't ask you to do difficult things because he needs your assistance. Because he is somehow unable to accomplish what he wills and desires to do unless you and I all pitch in. He asks you to do difficult things so that you can step out of your comfort zone and be a part of what he is doing. That is an incredible blessing. But remember this, you're not supposed to go off and accomplish these things yourself. Because the truth is, you and I can't do that. You need only bring whatever you have to Jesus and watch Jesus get to work. It doesn't matter how meager it is. What you have will be enough to accomplish what Jesus wants to do through you. And be prepared because it may well be bigger than you ever imagined. So do not be doubtful. Do not be dismayed. You are not inadequate. You are enough. What you bring is enough. Not because of you, but because of the power of Jesus, who is and has more than enough. Jesus is abundant. So when following him is, di is difficult, do not lose heart, but turn to Jesus. Come to Jesus. His grace is enough. And when he shows his glory, remember that he is pointing to a bigger picture than the immediate situation. When Jesus is done feeding the 5,000, the people are amazed. They realize that he's a big deal. Surely this was the prophet who was to come into the world. And they want to make him king. But Jesus leaves. He withdraws again to the mountain by himself. You see, the vision that the crowd had was too small. Jesus wants you to make him king of your life. The whole of these Miracles, the whole point of them is to prove that he is the one God sent to reign and rule. And that when you come under the reign and rule of God, it is better than the way things are without Jesus. But he didn't come to be the sort of king the crowd is looking for. His kingdom is not of this world. And it does not come by force. The crowd is impressed by Jesus' healing power. They're amazed by his miraculous provision of food. And you know what they're thinking. If we make this guy king, we'll get free food and free health care. It's going to be great. They missed the bigger picture. 
Jesus doesn't get sucked into the politics of becoming a temporal king. Because he's got something far better in store. Rulers and administrations come and go. Jesus' abundant kingdom is eternal. And it doesn't come from governments or kings. You can't make it happen by force the way the crowd was hoping to. It comes through a simple act of faith. Trusting your life. To Jesus. So as we enter into what's shaping up to be a stressful week for our nation, maybe for you, trust in Jesus. His kingdom is eternal. His kingdom is abundant. And he will supply your every. Let us pray. Lord, thank you that you are indeed our King. And in the midst of every situation, and every trial, and every challenge, you are there with us. And Lord, when we come to the end of ourselves, you are enough. We thank you for your abundant blessings. May we have eyes to see them. And Lord, we come here today to remember all that you have done for us in the breaking of bread and sharing of the cup. And as we come here, Lord, we confess that we do not do this in our own righteousness. We are not here because we have earned a place at your table. We confess that very often we have failed to love you as we should, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We have not done that as we should, and we have left undone much that we ought to have done. And the Lord, yet you pour out your mercy and grace and forgiveness upon us. And so we pray that as we gather here, you will turn these elements from ordinary use to a sacred use for this time. We enter into communion with each other and you and with all the saints. We may be blessed, encouraged, and strengthened in the journey ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather here together, we take the bread and we take the cup. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are welcome to share in these things this morning. Because this is not simply for us, it is for all of God's people. For those who have gone before. For our persecuted brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. No matter what challenges we are facing, we take hope in this. When the Lord Jesus gathered his disciples, he took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ was broken for you.
Lord, be near to us. In these symbols of your body and blood. In the power of your Holy Spirit. The Lord, be with us now. And be with us as we go from here. For all the places in which you have called us. To do difficult things. In your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as our praise team closes us out this morning, singing for us, Break Thou the Bread of Life.